Hi, I'm Marsha Martin, and uh, I have here with me Marta Lochaman, if that's the right way to pronounce it. Marta, would you say it yourself? Lochaman. Hi, Marta. Okay, I would never have gotten the accent right. So, okay. Uh, so welcome, Marta. Marta is Thank you. a candidate for uh, this fall's um, Boulder County Commission election representing, uh, what do you call it, the East County area? District 2. So District 2, okay. Lions, yep. I should have done my homework better. That's all right. Longmont Lions, Allen's Park. <laughs> all right. Um, so this is my first serious long conversation with Marta. We've chatted before, um, but uh, I thought you would be interested in hearing uh, Marta's uh, uh, case for running for county commission and what she thinks that she is going to be doing as county commissioner. So first, Marta, why are you running? Why did you decide to run? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on too, Marsha. I appreciate that. And the question about why there's it's it's really a culmination of a lot of different pieces. But I think the impetus of like what made you decide to run um, for this particular position is one of the questions that has come up, and I think it's really important. So the after doing a lot of different work around the county over the last twenty eight years in different issues regarding just access to information and resources for what I believe is just everyday community members, single parents, teachers, etc., like myself. And after seeing that in several different institutions, and then going to work for the city of Longmont, I've worked for the city of Longmont a couple of times, but the most recent one was after the flood of 2013, mm -hmm. leading a data assessment um, coordination for the state of Colorado, Division of Local Affairs, who asked the 14 counties most affected in that flood of 2013, two years after the flood asked what happened to vulnerable populations and they were doing grant requests that the city of Longmont was one of the organizations who put in a proposal to find out specifically for our Boulder County community what happened to monolingual Spanish speakers during the flood. And so I was hired by the city of Longmont at the end of 2016 to do that data assessment for the state and respond to that question. That's three years after the flood. That was a significant natural disaster that is now documented with research connected to the climate crisis that we're in. And for me, three years later is an afterthought. And that was one of the pieces of being in community, seeing all of the different um, inequities in the way that access to information occurs for community members. So to be able to go in and do a data study was a really exciting opportunity to present information. And so that's what I did in a lot of different work and focus groups and conversations and interviews with folks all over the county and then created a report uh, for the state, created training materials that are still on the City of Longmont website. But one of those focus groups with a group of young Latinas in uh, our local school district here in the county, one of our local school districts here in the county. And we had gone through each focus group asking community members. We talked with middle schoolers all the way to our senior communities throughout the county and asked what were the gaps in access to information during the flood, any other barriers that were, um, that were felt, that were heard, that were seen for providers. Uh, working with monolingual Spanish speakers, etc. And one of those focus groups, uh, one of the young women went through the process, shared what had happened with her own family, shared how she had been a cultural broker for her family. We started talking about um, our students' circumstances, what they were feeling in their building personally and in their classrooms. And at one point she turned to me and I was working for the city of Longmont, so she was looking at me as a government employee and she said, Miss, Tell them to let us speak for ourselves. And that really was the voice and the reason that I said, you know what, this is bigger than me. This is community perspective who are facing inequities in basic information and resource in, in a whole lot of different places as I already stated. And so 
even as a previous teacher in, in St. Vrain Valley School District, I remember telling my students, just keep working hard. Adelante, si se puede. And, and then I realized with her voice that I have these experiences. I've worked on boards. I've worked on national projects. I've built company. I have um, worked in the housing industry. So why not take all of those experiences that are connected to local community members and let us speak for ourselves and be part of the decision making and the planning, the processes and the programs in Boulder County in a local way to build more impact. So that's a, a longer response to your question, but that was really the, the voice that started this campaign in 2018. Well, that's really, um, I'm impressed that you can get it down to that one seminal moment like that. Um, mm -hmm. glad that you care about it uh, enough about one individual that that she could make that kind of impact on you and say I am going to let you speak for yourselves um, and I'm gonna ask questions that I had planned to ask you out of order because this is such a good segue into question number three which sure. was what do you feel as a member of the Hispanic community, um, what do you feel that you are best positioned to accomplish both for that community and for the entire community of Boulder County? Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a big question. We could talk about that for a while, but it's important. And, and what I wanna make sure that, that your viewers and folks listening, et cetera, are really um, clear about is that the work that we do in Boulder County, whether it's for our LGBTQ community, whether it's for or with our elders, or it's our faith communities, or in this case, some of my background work um, is focusing on monolingual Spanish speaking and or bilingual families in housing advocacy. All of that work truly makes us better as a full community. And I say that because it affects all of us when we know our neighbors and we're connected to our neighbors and our neighbors know where the resources are when we have a natural disaster. That helps all of us, not just from a moral standpoint that we should be able to help our neighbors, not just from an ethical standpoint of everybody should have access to resources and information, but it's also a business standpoint. Like how do we do better financially as stewards of our resources from a local government standpoint, a county government standpoint. It's when our community members know how to access resources, whether it's day to day or it's an emergency situation or it's COVID related public health or it's natural disasters. And so that to me is one of the pieces around how it helps everybody and some of the other work that I've been doing um, since that project was, is around cultural brokering. And so with the Resiliencia para Todos, which is the Resiliency for All um, data assessment, after I finished that project, I was then hired. I do con consulting as one of my, my many jobs, Marta, and my many work, uh, you know, work projects as a single mom. That's what it takes. And I'm also an entrepreneur. So um, it's exciting to, to get out in community and do more. But one of, after that, I was asked to do facilitation for Community Foundation Boulder County. And that work, I was facilitating a national cohort for about 18 months. We got stopped here, um, just like so many other projects and great work due to COVID and not being able to do in-person workshops, et cetera. But that work was around this concept of how do we and how might we as county government or what institution you can fill in the blank, but how might we create conditions for Latino bilingual cultural brokers to influence decision making. And so that is another piece that I think is important for general everyone in the community to understand that people like me who are cultural brokers, it means that we are serving organizations, institutions around our county to meet needs, not just for this sector of monolingual Spanish speakers or this sector of elderly folks or whatever your mountain community, whatever your kind of focus area is, that is a reciprocal job. We are being bridges to government agencies or to nonprofits or to different organizations. 
And so I think that's important that people understand that it is a give and take conversation, it's a give and take action. And there's plenty of us all over the county who are offering that work and that service. And really, when I say service, it's giving back to not just the person that needs the support, but also to the organizations. And I saw a lot of them working with as an advisor for Longmont Economic Development Partners for the different chambers in our county, for the VOAD, which is Voluntary Organizations Action Active in Disaster, to our CERT, you know, our response team um, here locally that are all wanting to be able to support in this focus with this study, really to be able to and support um, monolingual Spanish speakers or bilingual families or the Lat Lat Latino community. And there's a real interest on both sides for us to be doing more work together. And so that's, you know, part of what I think the message is really important. Again, we are better together, but it means that we've got to do the work to be connected. I've participated in several um, uh, discussions, you know, the Just Transition Committee for Resilience and, and so on. Um, uh, also, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a really good, uh, a really good presentation, a really good event um, that was uh, um, around Cesar Chavez and, and um, uh, what life was like, you know, during the strikes and so on, and um, back then. And those events have been conducted using translation units um, as bilingual events, and they would switch to where the, the, the primary speaker was sometimes speaking English and sometimes speaking Spanish so that uh, one got an idea of what it was like to be the person who didn't understand the main event and had to um, understand sort of at second hand. Uh, and, and I think that that was uh, um, really a, a, a transformative experience for me. Do you mm -hmm. Having a more diverse local government um, aids in that in that building of awareness in an important way. Yeah, absolutely, and I think what you just shared um, is important. And I say that because if we haven't experienced anything similar to mm -hmm. their sector of our community, we can't say that we understand. We can't say that we are going to help you or we're going to work with you or, because we don't know what the needs are, right? We haven't been in, in mm -hmm. similar of an experience. Um, I do believe that one of the pieces you just mentioned is language and language access is really important. That's part of the work that I've been doing um, for years and years here locally um, about how we build up our Spanish speaking youth into career paths, how mm -hmm. to create opportunities here locally. We're such a fantastic hub of bilingual families and that's an ac academic success, but it is a career path. If we systematically set it up that way, that's a conversation I've been having for a long time. That was one of the reasons I got into the school district, got my master's and taught here locally because I knew there was a lack of representation and I knew that there was lack of a formal program to support that. Um, so that kids know that they have a skill and a talent because that's um, very lacking in conversations for a lot of our youth around our local community. Mm -hmm. The same reason that that representative um, authority figure for, you know, without a better term from a classroom standpoint, also translates into, if we look at our school districts, who are our teachers? Who are our staff? Who are our administrators? Who is our top leadership? And we can ask that question in any organization and local government is the same. I think personally, City of Longmont has done a really great job. I'm a big fan of Longmont. I've been involved for a long time. Me too. I, yeah, we, we have that in common for sure. I was one of the community members who was involved in creating the Longmont Latino Strategic Plan years ago in the early 2000s. That is now Longmont Multicultural Action Committee. I, mm -hmm the chair of that steering committee for years and ran that budget item, uh, the budget line for City of Longmont and also ran the health and housing task force. 
for that group. And part of that conversation, that was the impetus to get the Latino Chamber uh, started here in Boulder County. That was the impetus to get um, housing inspections, substandard housing looked at in a, in a new way and consistent long mm -hmm. systematic changes. And if we don't have people in leadership who are from our own communities, meaning in Longmont specifically, people who look like me, walk in life like me, are perceived like me, and we, the Hispanic community, Latino community, Latinx community, we are a third of our community. And so mm -hmm. to have that lack of representation, and especially when we talk about the commissioner's office, that's a big part, 20% 20, 20 of our county, um, who has never been represented. So and, you would be the first. Yeah. In the Boulder County Commission's office. For me, we have to go from leadership has to be represented to help community come together. That's mm -hmm. dynamic change. That's how our policies get changed. That's how our systematic, and that's the work I've been doing for a really long time is every place that I've been is how do we, how am I listening to community, hearing what needs are, and then creating institutionalized change. And so creating impact requires someone like me to be in that seat with all those skills to be able to support just what you're talking about. Like, what would that really look like and how would that support community? That's an example. So I can see that you have a broad understanding and experience with, with what the, I won't call it a problem space, although in some cases it does pose a problem. You mean when the, um, in 2013, when the flood came in overnight, Mm -hmm. people were being called in to the city offices to work the disaster management. Um, it was a big deal that the city already knew who was bilingual because you had to have a bilingual person on every single phone. Yeah. And, and that was, a, that was an example of how the city of Longmont specifically was more prepared mm -hmm. than cities around the county. I mean, that's a great example. And some of those pieces are, how can we do that more broadly at a county level? Right. And so because you do have that experience, I can get back to the question too. Oh, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> which is, what are your specific main goals to accomplish while you're serving on the commission? Yeah, there's a few pieces. And for me, it's a continuation of the work that I've been doing with an equity lens about really including more people into these conversations and doing similar but but more broad collaboration with our nonprofits and with our agencies with our companies etc to really affect and change around affordable housing um, accessible housing to continue the amazing work boulder county already has when we talk about climate action and sustainability and resiliency and environmental action, we are way ahead. We're nationally recognized from a county perspective. And so those programs have to continue. And how do we include more people in those conversations? Because as you and I have talked a little bit offline, there's some really big uh, issues we, around climate change that are affecting, uh, that is, you know, it's, it's not a secret anymore. It's finally starting to be talked about here locally that are affecting um, people of color in a disproportionate way. And mm -hmm. so I believe the same way that we've been talking about, people of color also have to be at the leadership table to ensure that we're part of the conversation so that we can include as we work on all of these different issues. And there's a lot of community needs issue. And so my work is going to continue to be focused on those different pieces. And I think the other, the piece around that that's um, important is that a lot of this role is also management and support of our 2000 Boulder County employees. And so for me to be able to use my expertise and experience on the um, Longmont United Hospital Board of Directors to be able to use my experience with the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals and that board and other committees and task forces that I've been involved in here locally to take those perspectives and make sure when I'm representing Longmont, but also all of Boulder County mm -hmm. to do that same work that commissioners really have to be focused on here locally from an administrative standpoint. You know, that, that is important. It's not a secret 
that our Latino community tends to be less economically advantaged than, than the uh, county population as a whole. And one of the things about that, uh, you know, you were talking about future things. You were talking about we're going to have a climate emergency and the adaptation to that and so on. Mm -hmm. It's much harder when you are without means and without leisure, which is what ends up happening, um, uh, to look ahead 10 years and think how you're going to be impacted and to stand up for, uh, for your situation. So you're going to have to, I think, be, you'll be a person who's aware of that and can, and can pull people in to that activity, which might not happen organically. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely. And that's, you know, the economic piece of where we are and what's happening, you know, due to COVID and what's going to be coming down the, the pike in, in regards to our budget here locally, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Those are also pieces that with my finance background and being in the mortgage world and being in the real estate, like that's what I do every day is work on legal contracts and it's connected to land use and easements. And, and that's a lot of the work that county commissioners do. Um, also this piece around the, the way that we, like you said, how do we include community and make it a real authentic um, connection to the, the same needs that are from an economic standpoint. That also means what happens for, with our employees, what's going to happen with our employees moving forward and the way that businesses are being affected right now. Um, what is that going to look like six months from now? And when you talk about that planning piece, using, using work that I've been involved in as a self-employed person for the last 20 years, if you, you know, for folks who've never been self-employed, um, it's a very different experience of being your own CEO, of being your own CFO, of creating your budgets and your plan and managing other people's finances, really what I've been doing for a really long time. And that's all it too. The property taxes and the way that things get funded here in our county. And so that, those different perspectives are, are really unique for a county commissioner and I think even for a lot of government um, electeds. I think so too. Um, Everyone would think we were crazy if we did not mention that today here, as we speak, we have a movement of public demonstrations uh, all over the country that were touched off by uh, the death of George Floyd in particular. Um, but uh, having to do with essentially this concept that Black Lives Matter, and I don't think that means black like out of Africa it means people of color who who have who who are are called out by their experience and their culture as different from um, from the economic and voting majority in this country um, and what we have here now is a, either a wonderful thing or a scary thing depending on who you are but mm -hmm. While the sun is up, at least, what we have is a wonderful thing where um, persons of all backgrounds are going down and showing their support uh, for this movement and acknowledging that we have a problem of unjust deaths um, uh, that are being perpetrated by our police because, well, I'm not even sure what the because is. I should be asking you what the because is. Um, what is your uh, perspective on that? Uh, what, what are the diverse peoples of America um, rejecting about the current day America that has brought them all together in this demonstration? That's a big question for no, who, I love the answer, but I, I agree 100% like this is an important topic and you're right, the, the responding to it and inquiry about what, you know, what's really happened is super important. It's going to become more important. My hope is that it's not just a meme. It's not just a dialogue. It's not just showing up for a protest to say I'm out on the periphery watch, watching from the outside because that in itself is privilege. Mm -hmm. and 
to me, Black Lives Matter is the movement that truly has to, just needs to be there as Black Lives Matter. Because in this country, historically, I'm an ethnic studies major, I've been really involved in, in inequities from a lot of different perspectives, but I also want to make sure that our, you know, my Black brothers, my Black sisters understand I'm not here speaking on their behalf. I also want to make sure and acknowledge that um, Black Lives Matter, and we have a historical um, issue in the United States about how we have systematically pushed Black people in this country to the periphery in every single way. And systematically, there is a link and there is a connection to our Indigenous people, our Native people are people of color um, who have also been left out on the periphery and, and meaning not in the same way, but also systematically from everything to the way that finance systems operate, have operated where people can live and have been able, historically been able to live. Those are connected back to the pieces that you already mentioned about the economic gaps. It just, it didn't just happen that black people or indigenous people or native people or people of color, um, the Hispanic Latino demographic in this country uh, suffer from significant economic gaps. It is historical processes, it's legislation, it's rules and restrictions that have kept other people on the outside of even participating. And we can look at even from voting, you know, and, and yeah. all the historical ways that that have disenfranchised folks in significant ways. A lot of those mechanisms centered around real estate. Does your experience uh, in real estate and finance give you a better insight as to uh, how to make sure that, that the new mechanisms, the land use and zoning changes that we put in and stuff are gonna advantage people and tend to um, tend to work for social justice rather than anything else? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's an important question. And I believe, you know, for me, that's one of the reasons why my candidacy is so um, unique, but also so important because over the last 20 years, that's, you know, it's one of the stories that I talk about a lot in my financial literacy work. I am a guest instructor all over for that type of work as a national trainer for the Hispanic Wealth Project. And one of my first um, experiences working in a bank downtown Boulder, I worked in restaurants, you know, um, for years and years, and then got an opportunity for an interview in a bank that changed the trajectory of my life. And I tell people that because it wasn't something I ever expected to do. Um, but being a bank teller um, as a college student and then being called on from the other side of the bank, which in the banking world, it's kind of like business, you know, you're uh, with the big wigs or your, you know, frontline or your entry level, whatever it is. And that was that, that same scenario for me that day. I was called over to a banker who uh, told me she needed me to translate for her and handed me the phone and told me, tell him he's been denied for his loan. <gasps> and... That was my first experience in a professional landscape where I, you know, she was handing me the phone. And so I just told him in Spanish, perdón, negaron su préstamo. Like how humiliating, embarrassing, how horrifying to have to tell someone that news. Even if I had been part of that conversation from the very beginning, that would have been hard news to share. And then she put the phone back and said, okay, go. When she passed the phone back, it, I could hear him asking in Spanish, like, ¿Cuáles son mis opciones? ¿Qué tengo que hacer? What else? You know, what, the same thing you and I probably would ask, like, okay, what are my other options? What do I need to do? Did I miss something? Is there a different loan? Yeah. And it, that was truly for me the beginning of what forced me to keep working really hard in this world of finances because then I started understanding how significant the inequities of, again, of resource and information. And I also recognized at that moment, I did not know enough to help that person. And I also wasn't being given the opportunity to know enough to help that person. And so that really began my career in banking. 
um, and moved up into management. And then I took an opportunity for the same reason in the mortgage industry that somebody wanted my, me because of my bilingual skills. They knew there was an economic benefit to that company. And then it happened on, in the real estate world. But all of that is connected and it's been my personal responsibility to continue how much more can I learn and how many more people can I bring forward with me? Because in this country, if you don't have finances, you don't have economic stability, you don't understand capital, you don't understand credit, you will never get ahead. People don't like to say that, Marsha, but the reality is in this country, finances matter and money is connected zip code matters and if you don't have money you don't get into the same networks and you don't get to the same positions and it's wrong it is wrong and it's wrong to me i keep coming back to that and i know you had a long story of your career to tell but I could, you mean they didn't let you answer the poor man's other questions right wow so and i mean so that began the piece of and i and it still happens today that was back 1995 uh, and but that you know again so I moved myself up in that company and I and I brought forth we have to change our policies we need bilingual people here it became very evident to me. somebody needs to be bilingual in this building every day all day not just part-time when I'm working because mm -hmm. Spanish-speaking clients that are walking into this building and that happens everywhere around our county so What's our responsibility, again, to do better together, whether it's morally, ethically, right. or from a business standpoint, when we take care of different segments of our population who right now are not included or not resourced or not supported, we're missing a really important connection to do better. Yeah, you're, you are, we're, we're wasting all of that human capital and all of the talents that those people have that's a really, and that's what, you know, from a, from a teacher, educator standpoint, that's, we are, we're missing a significant opportunity to bring people up and lift them up, but give them the skills, give them the clear career paths, give them job opportunities, meaning whatever sector of the community that we're talking about. All right, good. So we are, we're running up against our 30 minute limit, but there's a, one kind of important noun that I think got stepped on in all of the talk that we had, but you mentioned the, what is it, Hispanic Wealth Project? Oh, yes. Is, can, can you just, a one-liner about that? Because I think it was important, I, I think that it's important that people know that's what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, so that's, I'll try and be really, really brief on that. So I am a certified trainer for the Hispanic Wealth Project, which is a national initiative that's connected to the work uh, that I've been involved in uh, with the board here locally of uh, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. The focus of Hispanic Re uh, Wealth Project is based on data from like 2014, and it's addressing homeownership, small business, and also investment specifically for our Hispanic Latino demographic around the, the United States. Mm -hmm. Then it, from a national level as a trainer, um, and there's 44 of us in the country that are now certified trainers. Um, wow. Is, again, it's about addressing the inequities of the financial system. It's about, um, you know, just one of those small pieces is, is addressing homeownership. And so just from a data standpoint, if about 76 to 78 percent of white Americans in this country own their home, mm -hmm. 50 percent of our Hispanic, Latino, Latinx demographic own their property. So just in that small piece, that's a significant discrepancy because you and I know um, as property owners that that is the way that we build access to one banking relationship, which is significant. It's capital. It's long-term equity. It's for a lot of us, it's a retirement fund. For a lot of us, it's the way that we pay for college or make major plans for our family members. Mm -hmm. so that's just you know one example of the systematic differences of how policies have brought community, some communities further along in, in the financial realm mm -hmm. economics in this country. Wonderful. You would bring a lot of important knowledge 
uh, I think, to, to Boulder County's housing policy, which is tremendously important. Uh, Thank you. We, as we strain the boundaries of land use that we have here. Yeah. Yep. And it's complicated and it also requires, um, I believe, a different lens and a different perspective to come up with creative solutions that we can do to open more doors and housing for all of us here locally. It's so imperative and it's going to become even more so um, as we rebuild from COVID-19. Yes. Um, one final question, and I know it's got to be brief because we, we okay. raise everybody's eyes who watches this. <laughs> have this movement going on um, that, that looks like it's going to be really transformative. Um, I hope, I'm hoping that it's really transformative in America. Um, do you believe that it's going to help you be more effective uh, as a commissioner? that you are going to be coming in in the aftermath of something that was really big but maybe really controversial or do you think it's going to make your job harder it's a good question i mean there's to me there's two pieces of that one is is this current situation opening enough people as you, you kind of talked about you know the way that some of this the protests and these opportunities for people to start having these tough conversations is that going to open up our local communities um leadership ownership community activism into true policy change and true action that would create to me a bigger wider broader opportunity for me to lead as a county commissioner and it also, for me, helps me understand that there are more people, again, that need to be part of the decision making and the work that I do going forward. But I do believe it's twofold because if our voters, as an example, decide that they are really, um, that they really are satisfied with status quo and they really don't want to have that, um, those other perspectives, then we won't be accepting a huge opportunity here locally in Boulder County to make systematic long-term change with representative democracy, but representative leadership from our county commissioner office. So I think it is a big opportunity and it's a big challenge. And, and again, I think the message is for people to understand that it truly is a benefit for everybody and and i'd love to hear your thoughts about that too is you know what what does more representative leadership mean to you and how do you feel like that could potentially be a benefit for all of us here locally well i think you have done a really good job of convincing me that that your perspective is necessary um you know just as those experiences with with being on the outside of the bilingual dynamic um, that we've held in long ahead was uh, gave me a new perspective, and I think your perspective um, is going to be really important, e especially if, as it did in the 1960s, you know, the country really does take on the challenge of racial justice, and we're having hints now that maybe we're ready for taking the next step in that after pretending there was no problem for so many years. Um, so thank you, Marta, for coming here and talking to me today or virtually coming here and talking to me today. Yeah. And thank you for taking on the challenge and, and the risk of, of doing this. So I really appreciate it and um, best of luck with your candidacy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And the, it's a great conversation and it's important to continue these dialogues. So that's really important too, Marsha. I appreciate you. Well, you maybe do it. You, maybe you can come back in a while and we'll do it again when something else big is going on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank Goodbye, you. Marta. Thank you Bye. again. Take care.